And please welcome to the stage, Simon Jones. I have a theme tune. I like that. I like it a lot. So hi, everybody. Some of you know me already. I'm Simon Jones. I'm director of the enterprise team here in Europe, EMEA. And it, I, lead, I lead the team whose job it is to help non-games companies be successful with Unreal Engine. So you'll meet me and hopefully the rest of the team through today. And to give us a little bit of insight into what we're planning on doing with not just this version and the next one, very pleased to welcome on stage uh, the general manager of Unreal Engine at Epic Games, Mark Petit. Thank you, Simon. Good morning, everybody. Aren't you glad we gave you a lot of time for breakfast? All right, it's getting going. So I'm going to talk a little bit about Unreal Engine. We're going to focus on the near future, try to make it very concrete for you guys. But first of all, I want to say a word about Twinmotion. As Simon reminded us, Twinmotion is a fantastic tool. We released it in April. Uh, success has been overwhelming, more than 300,000 users, mostly in architecture, if you know it's a presentation tool, but also we're starting to see them in schools and in all kinds of usage to create stills, video, and interactive content. So um, in, we, we said to you guys that Twinmotion would be free until uh, November 2019, and we are in November 2019, so the news I have for you today that we're extending this period to early next year because we're finishing up Twin Motion 2020 that you can see a little bit of a side-by-side -side here. It's a major upgrade of the technology, and you'll see it's going to be just amazing. The visual fidelity is going to be much higher. We've upgraded all of the assets, all of the vegetation, all of the characters, new lighting capabilities, new story mode. That uh, new lighting technology is absolutely amazing for architecture. So we have a lot of great capabilities being built into Twinmotion 2020. He will come early next year. The other big thing is we acknowledge the importance of Rhino as a design tool in architecture, so we'll have a direct connect to Rhino. And finally, the thing that you've been waiting for is we'll be able to export all of those projects and all of those assets into Unreal Engine. So you can have someone start in Twinmotion and finish in Unreal Engine. So watch this space. We'll be uh, starting betas and demonstration of Twinmotion 2020. It's going to be great. Now, and to Unreal Engine. Back at SIGGRAPH, um, feels just like yesterday. It's such a busy year. Uh, we released for Unreal Engine 4.23 with a big focus on digital production workflows and collaborative editing, which is a really groundbreaking capabilities. And you know, we have this good demo with in-camera visual effects and LED walls. So in a few weeks, and you saw the preview last week, we're going to release Unreal Engine 4.24. And 4.24 builds on that theme of virtual production. And the big news there is USD support and live USD support, so it becomes extremely easy and natural to synchronize what you do in the engine with your offline post-production pipeline. So USD is, you know, is a groundbreaking innovation in the industry. It's an open source format developed by Pixar, and we're actually seeing it catch in many, many other industries and movies and is going to be at the core USD support of Unreal Engine 4.24. The other big news in 4.24 is the, um, the introduction of hair and fur rendering. You can author your strands in Maya XGen, in Shaven or Haircut, in uh, Yeti, and then you'll be able to render photorealistic renderings of it. I'm not going to run through everything. Lots of quality of life, improvement, quality of life improvements for mobile and AR, support for HoloLens 2. You can see our Apollo demo in the back room, HoloLens 2 demo, and we're going to release those assets for you guys with 4.24 so that you actually see how we've been doing it. AR, -Cat, AR A, I can't pronounce this. AR Kit 3 support is actually coming. Retracing, huge topic for us. This is our third release of retracing. It's a very mature tool set. We've much improved the, the global emission solution, so we're constantly amazed by the, the pictures that you guys do uh, with that. But if you're not into RTX, we also have this amazing screen space global illumination technique. It's a post-processing effects, and it gives amazing results. So another big theme for us. You know, we're a big fan of blenders, um, but we think that the traditional modeling tools that don't just do a perfect job at creating the content that we need for interactive use. So what you're going to start to see in Unreal Engine is more 
content creation tools. And 424 has the first batch of, of polygonal modeling tools uh, built inside the engine so that you can create content right there in your environment. We also added 3D text. Our customers in motion graphics and broadcast were clamoring for 3D text. So you'll see that's going to be one of the big things moving forward is content creation from within Unreal Engine. So that's a lot of capabilities. All of that is available to you now. It's on GitHub. Uh, Unreal Engine 424 Preview 1 is up. But the big, big thing is Datasmith. So, you know, I would say that's we started the beta of Datasmith two years ago. And I feel that this release is the one we've been promising to you, particularly on two fronts. First front is performance. We've optimized the hell out of that thing. And please do me a favor, go home, download Preview 1, and throw the freaking biggest model that you have at Datasmith and see what it does and give us feedback. Because we know we're very, very proud of the performance, and it's something pretty unique. And then the other thing that we wanted, you know, the vision behind Datasmith is like to, we know asset preparation is not fun. Nobody wants to spend time doing asset preparation. So we wanted to make the tools intuitive and automagic. It's always been the vision behind Datasmith, make the data conversion automagic. With uh, this research assessments, we're getting one step closer to that vision. We've introduced visual data prep, which is a very intuitive tool where you can actually stack blocks and filters and operators and fully automate the recipe to process your assets. So then when the guy shows up, hey, I have another version of the Revit files, you're laughing now. You know, this is not the nightmare. You don't have to call home to say you will be late. This is going to be all automated processing. So you get to see this if you register for the session. There's a session that's going to go into the detail. So that's Datasmith. So very proud of what's coming up. And again, it's out there for you to try. And you remember, two, 18 months ago, in March of 2018, we launched the beta of Unreal Studio. Because we knew about gamers, but the enterprise space was a little bit new for us. So Unreal Studio has been quite successful. You know, we have 200, 350,000 people. By the way, they're not the same. They downloaded Twinmotion. Twinmotion got us a lot of new users. So it's been a very success. And we've been working with you guys for the past 18 months to understand the kind of products that you need outside of games. And here are the takeaways from us about, um, about Unreal Studio. One thing we learned, we kind of knew it, but we confirmed is that the engine, the core engine, does 90% of what every market vertical wants. You know, we all need the same. Interactivity, gameplay scripting system, all of that stuff is in common. And then what we learned as well is there is a lot of power in having everybody use the same data model. Because now across industries, you can start sharing objects, but not just objects and scenes, but fully simulated world. That train project in Sweden is a combination of Beam and CAD and GIS, all aggregated you know, into this fully simulated environment. So there's a lot of power. That's, that's takeaway number two. Takeaway number three is that we build data smiths for the enterprise customers, but the gamers love it. I mean, it's a fantastic tool to create a content pipeline. So we had a lot of feedback from the games company about them adopting data smiths. And finally, one of the things that we realized is in the enterprise space, companies of all sides, but mostly the big companies, have a very, very strong appetite to have close interaction with us. So we've, been, we've built Great teams, fantastic people, and we've created for ourselves a very, very nice support business supporting the likes of GM and Audi and all those customers uh, to help them integrate interactive content into the workflow. So that's the four takeaway we have around Unreal Studio. So let's come back to the defining moment of modern Epic, March 2015, when we decided to reel the Unreal Engine for free and created a fantastic business for us. You know, we're a slightly different company. We're both a technology and a creative company at Epic, and we are very focused on the long term. We do not make decisions for short-term financial return. That's just not who we are. That's not who Tim Sweeney is. So and if you look at everything we do, our engine, our game Fortnite and the Battle Pass, and our store, we always try to choose the business model that works for everybody. So after 18 months, of working with your own studio, we reached the conclusion that we don't need it. So that's the end of the road for Unreal Studio. 
What it means is that as of Unreal Engine 4.24, Datasmith becomes a feature of the main engine. And therefore, it's available for everybody, for free, and forever. How do you like this? And the bonus is, of course, that when we release capabilities into the engine, they are in source code form. So the source code of the Datasmith is on GitHub right now. And not that you need the source code to use it, but you'll be able to build upon it and extend it and integrate deeper into your workflow. So let me summarize it, what it means for Unreal Engine 4 and 4.24, again, in a few weeks in December. So the entirety of our technology is now available for free on GitHub. There's nothing that's not available. You can come to me and get something else. It's all out there. We have a lot of free resources around the engine. We have great documentation, great tutorials. We are our free online learning platform when you can do your classes, you can earn your badge, you can share those badges and brag about your skills. All of that ecosystem is available for free. And there is no catch. You can check the licensing terms. They're extremely generous. And so we have entire companies building their business around this product. Some of you require more interaction with us and support, and we're very happy to ask Simon Jones to set you up with one of our support offerings. But I want to make sure that you guys understand that our free product is not something that is, is not a, a bait to get you to pay something. This is our business model. We're very happy to share those tools with you guys. So that's for Unreal Engine 4.24. Next, so, so let's see where we are now. We have this great engine. We have all those resources on the internet, but we're still faced with a problem. That quality of content that you see here on the screen is really expensive to build. That's what all of you want, particularly in the enterprise space. Photoreal content is very important. But the cost of creating this high quality 3D content is becoming usually expensive. So our vision is to reduce the cost of creating photorealistic content by creating a vast library of assets that can be customized and reused. So to illustrate this point, I want to play you a video that we did with our friends from Quixel back in March for GDC. Adaptation, the ability to learn from past experience, the use of knowledge to alter their environment. These virtues defined our creators and drove them to the brink of destruction. But we cannot exist without them. We must save her. exists within us. Humanity has always had the potential to recognize its flaws and choose a better way. Can we save humanity? Was bringing her here the right choice? All right. So, is this the quality that you aspire to build, even if you're a small team? So, to discuss that, it's my pleasure to welcome on the stage the luminary and the visionary behind all of this technology, our friend Teddy Bergsman, the CEO from Quixel. Please, Teddy, come on stage. We've been...
Thank you, Mark. We had so much fun working with those guys creating this video and this content and the mega scan. So, so we decided to take the next step. So I'll let you talk about the next step. Thank you so much. Hi, everyone. I'm Teddy. And today I have a big announcement to make. We're taking the next step as a company, and we're joining the Epic family. Thank you. Thank you. Our mission is to scan the world and to provide AAA content for everyone. And as part of Epic, we can greatly accelerate that mission. And we can also help advance Unreal Engine by offering a vast library of photorealistic 3D scans to all Unreal Engine users for free. <laughs> <laughs> and Quixel is a team of over 100 passionate artists and engineers uh, spread across six continents. And I wanted to give you a small glimpse into what we do every day here at Quixel and how we capture the world. So for the past decade, our teams have traveled every corner of the world, and our engineers have invented new ways for artists to access scans. And the result is Megascans, Bridge, and Mixer. So Megascans is the world's largest scan library. It's the fastest growing library. And it contains pretty much every piece of content that you need to create any scene imaginable. And Bridge gives you instant access to the entire library and lets you download content straight into Unreal with just a single click, and any other software for that matter. It's the ultimate time saver. And Mixer empowers artists to be creative with the scan data. So you can leverage scans, procedural tools, and PBR painting to create completely unique content. So from photoreal to stylized, it's, it's up to you. And Megascans is widely used by the largest studios out there. Um, and most projects today rely on it. And when we started Quixel, our goal was to make a positive impact on the field of computer graphics. And as one with Epic Games, I firmly believe that we can create a seismic shift. So building photorealistic 3D content, as Mark pointed out, is hugely expensive. And it requires hundreds of artists, years of work, to bring a single grand vision to life. And we wanted to change that. We set out to create a vast standarded library of all the content that you need and provide it to everyone whether you're a big AAA studio or you're a small indie developer. So we wanted to create a world where even a single person could, a single person with a strong vision could create basically quality that matches the biggest projects out there. And as Epic Games is now setting Megascans free to Unreal 4 users, I believe that today, the world is becoming a reality. So here we see how easy it is to browse the library. Um, and you can find the hidden temples of Angkor Wat, 
you can build Rome in a day. And we're capturing all major natural biomes and architecture. And here we see how we can leverage AI to help you find the content that you need quicker. Input a piece of photography or concept art, and Megascans will find those assets for you, streamlining the environment creation pr production process. And this is a small glimpse into, into what we can do with AI. More to come. So thousands of assets have been curated into a wealth of collections. And this lets you find content easily. It helps inspire you. And you will find large collections spanning natural environments, architecture, interiors. The list goes on and on. And we're working on bringing all of these collections also to the Unreal Marketplace for free. Um, and as of today, you can access 10 of these packs plus the complete Rebirth collection. So Megascans is a massive, living, breathing thing. And we're adding tons of assets every day. And having access to all the content you need from the get-go is a huge time saver so that you can focus on being creative. That's what matters. And to unleash this creativity, we made Mixer. So you can take any Megascans asset, you can make it your own. Conform the entire Megascans library to your unique style. Leverage scans from the entire library, PBR painting, procedural elements, sculpting, create hard surface textures using powerful smart materials to essentially texture incredibly complex geometry in no time. Create your own smart materials to unify the look of a multitude of assets. Here we took some gray lava rocks and made them into a sandstone desert. And when you marry the Megascans ecosystem with Unreal, amazing synergies happen. Fire up the engine, get a jump start with the library, and import your customized content with ease, all for free. And what you're seeing here is just a glimpse into the potential that we're giving to artists and how they leverage Megascans and Unreal to create beautiful worlds. Now, when we created Rebirth, our relationship with Epic Games deepened. And we got to truly explore the potential of achieving photorealism in real time. And this led us to work closer than ever with the Epic team and to further explore the field of virtual production where the physical and digital converge. Seeing actors and directors fully immersed in an interactive digital world running in real time was an exhilarating and breathtaking experience for me. And it's this convergence of creative paradigms that I'm so incredibly excited to, to see finally happen thanks to easy to use tools, content libraries, and real-time technology. So thank you very much. We are humbled to be part of Epic, and it's been great to be here. Thank you. Wait. <laughs> it's It takes a bit of time to, to process that, so l let me make sure we understand. So first, we're colleagues. We get to work yes. together with the awesome Quixel team. So more badass at Epic. We love that. That's good. Second, so the entire Megascan library is going to be free for Neural Engine users. Yes. And it's kind of, some of it is available now, today, right now. Um, so you should wait. We're not finished. But as soon as we finish the session, you can go <laughs> on the marketplace and download that. The rest will be made available in the next few weeks? Correct. What about the non-real engine users? We're slashing prices for everyone else. That's how we roll, guys. It's so becoming more affordable for everybody. And what if you purchase Megascans recently? If you purchase Megascans recently, you will get a refund. If you're an Unreal Engine user, you will get a full refund. Mm -hmm. 
And if you're a user of any other tool, then you will get a refund for uh, the last subscription purchase, more or less. That's amazing, Teddy. Thank you so much Thank you. for being with us. Thank you, Mark. This is going to be huge. Thank you. All right. So that's our news for today. So if I recap, Unreal Engine 424 Preview 1 is out. It has all those things I mentioned. Not going to go through them. Data Smith is a standard feature of Unreal Engine 424, available for free as source code. No more Unreal Studio as a release of 4.24. Twin Motion, free period extended. So mega scans in Unreal Engine, I think we got that too. So 4.24 is going to be a huge release for, for everybody, all the industries, using that same version of the engine. And then we're extending the free period of Twin Motion to 2020, and we get an amazing version of 20 Motion in, in, the, in the books for you. So. That's my news for today. Thank you very much. I want to show you, introduce our, so give a big cheer for the guys at Quicksoul and, uh, and the Data Smith team. So now we want to inspire you a little bit more. So let me run a little bit of video to introduce our next presenter and I'll bring him on stage. Big hand for Mohen Leo, Visual Effects Supervisor at ILM. Mohen, Hi, take it you. away. Hi, so um, I work as a Visual Effects Supervisor for Industrial Light and Magic, but for the last couple of years, I also work for ILM XLab, which is Lucasfilm's immersive entertainment studio. And as you saw from the introduction video, we create, uh, create a wide variety of entertainment content using Unreal Engine. Today I want to talk about some of the lessons we learned over the past few years on how to create memorable, engaging content for AR, VR, and other media. And I hope that some of these points will translate to your work, even if you're not working on entertainment content at all. Personally, I started working with VR about four or five years ago, on and off, and I liked it, but initially more as a tool than anything else. But I distinctly remember the day that VR really clicked for me. On that day, I got a demo of one of the early experiences created by a company called The Void. The Void runs multiplayer location-based um, VR experiences, but they do a lot more than just put a headset on you. They match up a physical maze with the virtual content, so you can touch walls and buttons, and they use vibrating floors, haptic vests, wind machines, and even smells to hit all of your senses. So that day in that experience, I stood on a balcony on the outside of a 30th floor of a building, and I could feel the balcony sort of sway under my feet and wind in my face, and the whole thing was really, really vivid. And then after the experience was over, the staff took me through the same maze again, but this time with a headset off. It was just a bunch of walls and tech. And we get to a part where I see this plank sitting on the floor, and my brain goes, oh, that must have been the balcony. But then there was another part of my brain that very firmly and stubbornly said, no, I remember being on a balcony, and this is not the same place. Because the virtual memory, the fake memory that they had created, was actually more vivid than what had really happened. And at that point, I suddenly realized that you can actually use this tech to literally design memories. You can make someone remember a personal experience, have a first-hand memory of something that didn't really happen. So much has been said about VR's ability to create presence, the sense of really being there in the moment. But I think it's equally important to create content that is memorable and that stays with audiences long after the experience is over. 
I still to this day have a vivid memory of standing on that balcony. At ILMX Lab, we went on to create um, three VR experiences with the Void based on Star Wars, Wreck-It Ralph, and our newest one based on the Marvel Cinematic Universe. And we also create a number of other experiments and products, including mixed reality content with Magic Leap, an augmented reality fashion show, a theme park ride with Walt Disney Imagineering, and the episodic VR story Vader Immortal for Oculus Quest and Rift, all using Unreal Engine. So what I want to go over right now is some of the lessons we learned over the last few years, and I hope you find them useful, even if you're using Unreal Engine for something completely different. Because regardless of what kind of content you're creating, with all the hard work that you're putting into it, you want people to remember it. At ILMX Lab, we're all about storytelling, and we approach making this content often using some of the same tools used in story development for film or television. But even if you're making an architectural visualization or educational content or anything else, it's worth taking a step back and thinking about the story you're telling. Ask yourself if, after seeing your content, if you were told a friend about what you showed them, what is the story you'd want them to tell? What is the beginning, middle, and end? Because stories are a key mechanism our brains use to create context and remember facts and experiences. Increasingly, audiences also expect content that engages them personally. And that's a lesson we learned in VR, too. Some of our early VR prototypes were more like a film, where the viewer was just a fly on the wall, passively observing a scene. But we noticed that, in particular in VR, some of the social cues of the real world actually come into play. So if you watch two people having a conversation, but they're essentially ignoring you, you start feeling uncomfortable and pretty quickly disengaged. So our Vader story really only started to work when we redesigned it to make every moment about you, the viewer. Characters acknowledge you, speak to you, make eye contact, hand you objects, and for many players, these are among the most memorable moments. So regardless of whether you're using VR or not, I would say avoid making the viewer just observe passively. Let them participate. Interaction is part of the magic, magic you get from using a game engine rather than just playing a video. On that subject of interaction, people love touching objects, grabbing them, examining them, turning them in their hands, you know, pressing buttons, just touching the world. And so if you can, let them. We stuffed the first scene of our um, Vader experience full of a bunch of objects that you can do that with, you can pick up and examine, and people really love spending time with that. Even if you're just presenting a product and your interface are mouse and monitor, if you have the option, don't just render a view of a spinning object and make the viewer just sit there and watch it. If you can let them be the ones to like grab it, turn it around, zoom in, click on it, change the color, all of these interactions add up to a personal experience with the content that they'll remember. Just as important as letting people, um, is letting people drive the experience and progress at their own pace. There's a big difference between a passive video of a walkthrough and an interactive walkthrough. If you watched a movie and afterwards someone asked you to draw a map of a location in the film, most of the time you wouldn't be able to do that. But if you let someone explore a space actively, that's entirely different. Your brain starts building a mental map of the space. So it's really strange, but I have a clear sense of direction that in Vader's castle, the way from the prison to the hangar is a left turn and then up the elevator, even though that place doesn't exist. On the visual effects side, we let production designers use VR to explore the layout of sets before they are built because it gives them a much better sense of the space and the scale than a 2D drawing or a cardboard model. And recently, a member of our art department described to me the strange feeling of walking onto a practical film set that he had helped design and feeling like he had been there before because he remembered from seeing it in VR months before it really existed. For location-based experiences, we sometimes have the luxury of using haptic vests, wind, and so on. But even for in-home content, engaging as many senses as possible is important. 
Unreal Engine can render beautiful images, but it can do more than just visuals. For a lot of our content, it's just as important how it sounds and feels. We put a lot of effort, for example, into translating the feel, vibrations, and impact of a lightsaber to the Oculus Touch controller, Invader Immortal. And some fans have gone as far as creating custom solutions for connecting two controllers to get a more authentic feel of holding a single hilt. So if you're using AR or VR, using the ha um, haptic feedback in the controllers and giving the user a satisfying click or rumble in their hands when they pick something up is you know, really effective. Audio also plays a huge part in our sense of immersion and mood. We make expensive use of spatial audio in Unreal, so you can hold a lightsaber up next to your ear and you know, hear it hum and crackle or have a blaster like zip right by your head. And I think even a simple architectural visualization can suddenly feel more alive if you add a basic faint soundscape to it. One cool use of technology is making people look at the world differently and to take something familiar and put it in a different context. Because even the most mundane place can be transformed if, if you associate it with a vivid memory. Augmented and mixed reality have huge potential in this respect. It's not just about putting something magical into the real world for a short moment. Because even long after taking the glasses off, you might remember an otherwise unremarkable spot because that's where you saw that alien creature or that spaceship. Any content that is more than a couple of minutes long will start to feel stale if it only hits one note over and over again. So we try to constantly vary the tone. In VR and AR, for example, scale extremes work really well and people love looking at intricate things in their, in their hands, like in that closed space. And they also love looking at like big vistas and huge creatures and structures. So we try to use the full breadth of the spectrum and alternate between the extremes. So if we want somebody to be blown away by like a big open space, then right before we might put them in a small tunnel or a claustrophobic um, uh, elevator. So when the big space opens up, it feels even bigger. Think about whether in the context of your content, there's something people always wanted to see or do, or if there's a memory they bring into your experience that you can leverage. Referencing a memory of something familiar can be really effective as a shorthand to trigger an emotion. We incorporate callbacks to iconic cinematic moments from the films in our VR content all the time. A few years ago, on the film side for Rogue One, we worked with the previous company, The Third Floor, to create some environments in Unreal Engine and use them to light the cockpits during the film shoot. Everyone's favorite content, without a doubt, was the hyperspace jump. And everyone who got a chance to sit in the cockpit and experience that loved it because it was a moment they had imagined since they were children, but probably never expected to see with their own eyes. This clip from Solo is actually all in camera, so this is actually what it looked like in the Millennium Falcon set, but only a handful of people got to experience it there. Now in the theme park ride Smuggler's Run we developed with Walt Disney Imagineering, visitors can have the same experience and even fly the Falcon. So if you can deliver on wishes or fantasies that people already have in their heads, even some that are much smaller or simpler than this, they'll not only love it in the moment, but they'll remember it and cherish that memory. In the end, what all of this adds up to is this. Audiences are bombarded with sensory input every moment of the day. And you're working too hard on your content to let it get drowned out and forgotten. The power of using a game engine like Unreal is that you can make your content not only beautiful, but multi-sensory, interactive, and personal, and give every viewer a unique experience that they will remember. I'll leave you with a short trailer for our latest location-based VR experience, Avengers Damage Control, which is playing at void locations across North America right now, and will hopefully come here in the near future, too. Thank you. powerful threat has resurfaced. I sense that this force has been waiting, rebuilding its strength in secret until now.
Are you guys the new recruits? You fail to see the big picture. But no turning back now. Strange sent us. We're your backup. Ugh, that wizard glow circled right into the middle of our date. Scott, popcorn on the couch and reruns of Golden Girls is not a date. Stop calling it a date. Heads up, everybody. More incoming! Make good choices! Let's just give a round of applause again to Marin for an amazing, inspirational speech. I don't know what you mean, by the way, by Vader Castles not being real. If that's, not, if that's true, where does he live? Never mind. Come on. So that's all for me. I want to thank everybody for speaking today. Amazing presentations, some great announcements. And I look forward to meeting everybody and have a fantastic day today. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you.